We thought we had found a new component of the human cell. We panicked when a highly distinguished virologist thought it was just a contaminating virus. Was this the end of our fame and fortune fantasy? Hi, I'm Lenny Rome, the Vault Guy. I'm a cell biologist and a nanotechnologist. My passion is a common particle of the human cell called a vault. My goal is to describe vault discovery and to explain what vaults are to anyone interested. We found what we thought was a new particle in the human cell. So the last time we met, I told you about cells and their major components. If you haven't seen it, I'll put a link below. Today, I want to continue the story of the discovery of vaults. I'll cover three topics. First, I'll tell you a little bit about antibodies and why they are such important tools for cell biologists. Second, I want to address the worry that the discovery we thought we had made was just a contaminating virus. And finally, I want to tell you how we went about naming the new structure. In 1984, I was a struggling assistant professor at UCLA. Fortunate to have a new postdoctoral fellow join my lab. Her name was Nancy Kadersha, and she had just earned her PhD from Rutgers. Nancy was interested in following up on findings from my lab that small vesicles called coated vesicles contained enzymes that were being shipped to the lysosome. Because coated vesicles were involved in transporting stuff both into and out of the cell, Nancy wanted to see if the coated vesicles coming into the cell were different from those going out. Nancy was very clever, and before long she had figured out a way to separate coated vesicles by differences in their electrical charges. Nancy published the procedure as a new method to purify large particles from crude tissue homogenates. As part of this publication, she was able to demonstrate not only the fractionation and collection of coated vesicles, but in addition, she described the presence of a new particle that had not been seen previously. This was the same particle that my first graduate student, Corrine, and I had observed a couple of years earlier. But unlike Corrine, Nancy was very curious about this strange looking particle so she proceeded to refine the procedure, and soon she was able to prepare very pure preparations of this unusual particle. Here's an electron micrograph of the particle that Nancy purified. The scale bar is 100 nanometers. The magnification is nearly half a million times. At first, Nancy and I thought the particle might be related to coated vesicles mainly because the most abundant protein of this new particle was the same size as one of the coated vesicle proteins. I'm going to explain how we determine the size of a protein in a future video, so don't worry about it for now. In order to demonstrate that the new particle wasn't related to coated vesicles, Nancy made an antibody that's specifically bound to the new particle. You know, this might be a good time to tell you a little about antibodies and why they're so valuable to use as tools in the laboratory. Antibodies are proteins produced by the immune system in response to an infection. They are an important part of the body's defense system as they work to destroy disease-causing organisms, such as viruses or bacteria. Here's what a common circulating antibody called an IgG for immunoglobulin type G looks like. Each IgG is produced to attack a specific invading pathogen. They do this by binding to a small part of the invader called an antigen. The binding occurs at these two locations on the antibody. They are called the antigen binding sites. Remember the SARS-CoV-2 virus I showed you in episode one? People who have been exposed to COVID often develop antibodies to the spike protein, which binds very tightly here. This leads to a series of reactions that can inactivate or neutralize the virus. Antigen-antibody binding is very strong and very specific. 
It's amazing how an antibody can circulate through the bloodstream and encounter thousands of different proteins only to bind to one single target, the pathogen that it is seeking. This strong binding is the basis of the home COVID testing kits, where antibodies against COVID antigens have been placed inside the test strip, waiting to bind to COVID proteins in your nasal swab. I haven't been able to find any good explanations online of how the test kit works, so I'll give it a shot. The test strip uses three different antibodies. One antibody that is specific for a COVID protein and two other antibodies that bind to each other. These antibodies are there to make sure the test is working properly, something we call a control. Some of the antibody against COVID has gold nanoparticles attached to it. The control rabbit antibody also has gold attached. Both the gold labeled COVID antibody and the unlabeled COVID antibody are able to bind to one of the COVID proteins if it is present in your nasal swab. If the two control antibodies come in contact, they will form a binding complex with each other. Here is the typical test strip. There is a spot where the solution from a nasal swab is applied, and there are two locations where red bands might occur. The test location, labeled T, which means COVID is in your nasal swab, and the control location, labeled C. Under the plastic cover is a dry membrane. At the location where the nasal swab test sample is applied are the two gold labeled antibodies. At the location where the positive test is viewed is the anti-COVID antibody that is not tagged with gold. This antibody has been attached to the membrane so that it doesn't move. At the control location, the anti-rabbit antibody has also been attached. If a nasal swab sample that does not contain any COVID protein antigens is applied to the strip, the liquid will wick its way up the strip and carry the COVID antibody past the T location. The gold labeled rabbit antibody will get trapped in the area where the anti-rabbit antibody is located and the gold particles will concentrate there and they will diffract red light so a red line will appear there. If the nasal sample has any COVID antigens in it, they will bind to the gold tagged anti-COVID antibodies and they will now be trapped at the T line by the immobilized anti-COVID antibodies and there they will produce a visible colored red line. The appearance of this last colored line shows that the proper volume of specimen has been added and membrane wicking has occurred, which means that the test is valid. I'm telling you all this so you can appreciate the value and utility of having an antibody that is specific for something known or something interesting. Nancy made an antibody that could specifically bind to her new particle, illustrated here. However, when she added the antibody to coated vesicles, the antibody did not bind to them. This and other tests indicated that the new particle was completely unrelated to a coated vesicle. You know, during that time, I would show pictures of the particle to every cell biologist that I knew at UCLA and to any visiting scientist that happened to be at UCLA giving a talk. Everyone seemed fascinated, but no one had any idea what the particle was or if it had ever been described previously. However, one visiting scientist, a superb virologist named Ari Hellenius, gave Nancy and I quite a scare. Ari proclaimed that in his opinion, the particle must be a virus that had contaminated our tissue preparation. Boy, by that time, Nancy and I were completing the writing of a manuscript to describe the new particle. So in a panic, back to the lab we went to see if we could confirm or invalidate Ari's idea that the particle was a contaminating virus. So just what is a virus? A virus is an infectious microbe consisting of a segment of nucleic acid either DNA or RNA, surrounded by a protein coat. A virus cannot replicate alone. 
Instead, it must infect cells and use components of the host cell to make copies of itself. There have been a lot of discussions about whether viruses are living things. And although viruses do have some of the properties of living cells, they can't maintain themselves in a stable state, they don't make their own energy, and they don't grow. I agree with the suggestion that viruses are a lot more like aliens than any real living organism. The first thing we did to investigate whether the new particle that we had isolated might be a virus was to look for the presence of DNA or RNA. We were analyzing the components of the new particle using a technique that I'll explain in a later video. For this discussion, I'll just say that we could take the particle apart with a strong detergent and look at the sizes of the various components that were present using a stain that reacted with proteins. We saw these three bands indicating that there were three proteins present. Until the virus idea was raised, we didn't think of looking for DNA and RNA. So Nancy switched to a stain called silver stain that could detect these materials in our highly purified preparation of the new particle. Curiously, when she used this stain, she did find an additional band on the gel that indicated that it could be DNA or RNA. When she attempted to digest this new component with enzymes that would degrade DNA, the new band was unchanged. However, when she digested with an enzyme that could degrade RNA, the band was degraded. Thus, the new component was made of RNA. When we estimated the size of this RNA, we found that it was very small, less than 150 nucleotides. So could this be viral RNA? You know, very unlikely. As the smallest RNA virus that has ever been characterized is the human hepatitis D virus, which is about 1,700 nucleotides. So the RNA in our new particle was way too small to be from a virus. So, although Nancy had succeeded in demonstrating that the new particle was not a virus, we now knew that the particle was not simply made from protein. Rather, it was composed of three proteins and a small RNA. And thus, chemically, it couldn't be just called a protein particle. It needed to be classified as a ribonucleoprotein particle or RNP. RNPs are not unusual. Remember the ribosome I described in episode two? Ribosomes are among the most abundant particles of the cell, and they are RNPs too. Around that time, Nancy used the antibody she had made to show that the particle could be found in various tissues of the rat and in human skin cells. They were also in mouse brain cells and lung macrophages from rabbits. This suggested to us that this new novel particle was probably widely distributed among different cell types and different animal species. When Nancy used the antibody to detect the particle in the fibroblast that she grew in the lab, she used a common technique called immunofluorescence microscopy. To do this technique, cells are grown on glass microscope slides. They're treated with a fixative and a gentle detergent to make the cells permeable to antibodies. After incubating with the antibody that she had made against the new particle, the particles could be detected with a yellow fluorescent tagged secondary antibody. This is just an antibody that binds to the first antibody. The staining, which is shown here, suggested that the particle itself was being detected by those small yellow spots. And to our surprise, there were thousands of these spots in each cell. We were later able to accurately count the number of particles. And we were amazed that there were around 10,000 copies of this new particle in every mouse or human cell. I don't know the exact moment that it occurred to Nancy and me that we had probably isolated a new cellular component. I don't recall a eureka moment. It wasn't like suddenly we said, oh my God, a new particle. It was just that as we wrote up our results in a manuscript, we realized that if we were correct, we were in fact describing a cell component 
that had never been described before. As we prepared a manuscript on this new particle, we decided that we had to give it a name. We organized a Name That Particle competition with everyone in the lab participating. There were a lot of suggestions for the name that we should put forward, including hot dog, raspberry, and hand grenade, among others. However, the most common suggestion was that we name the particle a Romosome. You know, I thought naming the particle a Romosome was a terrible idea. And I didn't like the name Nancy Kadersha particle either. In general, cell biologists do not name discoveries after themselves, and even when they do, these names generally do not stick. When it comes to cell organelles and particles, I can only think of one exception, and that's the Golgi complex, an organelle that we described in episode two. This component was identified in 1897 by the Italian scientist Camilio Golgi, and only later was the name Golgi complex adopted to acknowledge his discovery. More recent cellular components started out with names that reflected their discoverer. For example, the Bangasome, named for Alex Bangham, and the Pilati granule, named for George Pilati. But these names didn't stick, and the current names, liposome and ribosome, were instead adopted. Names that reflect morphology or function are more likely to get used and retained. Since we had no idea as to the function of this new particle, we went with one of Nancy's suggestions, which came from the particle's shape. The negatively stained images viewed under the electron microscope displayed a very distinct and complex shape, resembling the multiple arches which form vaulted ceilings of cathedrals. Therefore, we adopted vaults as the name. Nancy and I finished writing up our first paper describing the vault particle, and we decided to send it to one of the top cell biology journals in the world. That's when we stepped into some science publication politics. I'm Lenny Rome, the Vault Guy. I hope you'll join me in my next video, where I will share some behind-the-scenes activity that determined the fate of our new discovery.